Why are you here today? For some of you, this is a habit. Praise God. It should be. It's a habit to come here on Sunday mornings to these gatherings, but I still want to ask you why. For others of you, this could be your very first time here. In fact, it is for some of you. I ask you the same question, why? Some of you are return guests or you're, you come every now and then and I would ask you the same question. Why? Why are you here? The question of why gets right at our motives, doesn't it? It cuts straight to the heart. It forces us into humble, honest contemplation. And I would like to suggest to you today that all of us, at least in some sense, must answer this question as it pertains to the idea of worth. Human beings do what they want. And human beings want what they deem to be worthy. When we say that something has worth, we are ascribing value to it. You're here today at least in part because you think there must be some value to your being here, some worth, or at bare minimum, you're exploring that possibility. And we're thankful that you are. If that's where you are, we're thankful that you're exploring the possibility that gathering here to worship the risen Savior might be a worthy undertaking. When we deem that something is worthy, we're saying that it deserves particular attention or recognition. It's notable, it's suitable, it's meritorious, virtuous, or admirable, or commendable. And so by and large, we human beings spend our time and money on whatever we deem to be of worth, of value. And we're highly annoyed, are we not, if we think that something was a waste of our time or effort, energy. Especially if you went thinking it had worth and then you found out, boy, I can't get that hour of my life back. Well, there's a dominating dilemma in Revelation chapter 5 that's presented to us. And it comes to us through the loud proclamation of a mighty angel. So in Revelation chapter 5, verse 1, John says, by inspiration of Holy Spirit God, Then I saw in the right hand of Him who was seated on the throne a scroll, written within and without, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll? And to break its seals. That question is the dominating dilemma. It's one you must ask and answer today. And I would say hundreds of times a day. We make hundreds of decisions every day based upon our answer to that question. Who? What? Is worthy? But I want you to hear the question as it comes to us in the context of this heavenly vision of worship that John has. It overwhelms and overshadows our mere day-to-day -day existence, what's going on in Revelation 5. John gives a heavenly vision and we get to peer into it with him by the grace of God. And so I want you to see in these first four verses the searching, sorrowful scene. The angel shouts out the question for the ages. Who is worthy to open the scroll, to break its seals? John is given a sneak peek of heaven and the very plans and purposes of God for the entire created order and cosmos are unfolding. In fact, the book of Revelation, it's called the Apocalypse of John, right? For a reason, because some of it certainly seems to apply, definitely applies to some things in the future and how God's going to bring it all to its rightful end. And this scroll that is um, in the right hand of God seated on his throne, it's very symbolic. And this book 
is symbolic. Its meaning is often enigmatic to us. But I want you to remember that the book of Revelation was given first and foremost to real first century churches. Its contents to those seven churches in Asia Minor were meant to embolden suffering saints. These churches in some way, all seven of them, are being persecuted from without and they have turmoil from within. And boy, that has been the story of the church in a fallen world for 2,000 years. But take heart to embolden these saints. God gave John a vision of himself. What do we need, church, in hard, difficult times? We need a vision, a big vision of who God really is. In all of His grandeur and majesty and glory, we need to see God high and lifted up and seated. Calm, cool, collected, in control of all things on His throne. If you'll back up to Revelation 4, I want to read some of that to you. Verses 1 and 2 establish a little context for us of this searching, sorrowful scene that Revelation 5 opens up with. Revelation 4 verse 1 says, After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. Skip to verse 8. He describes the scene around the throne, the appearance of God on his throne, these creatures. And verse 8 says, And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever. The 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy, there's our word, worthy are you our Lord and God to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. And that takes us then to, then I saw in the right hand of him was seated on the throne, a scroll, a book. This book seems clearly to symbolize the eternal purposes of God for all of life and history. The eternal unfolding revealed purposes of God for redemption and for judgment. The book of Daniel in the Old Testament serves as a very appropriate backdrop. It's why we recited from Daniel 7 just a moment ago where Daniel is also given a very similar vision of the Son of Man who's given absolute authority and dominion taking the scroll. And in Daniel chapter 12, an angel tells Daniel, seal up the contents of the book and it will not be known until later times, understood until later times. And I believe Revelation 5 is the later times, telling us how it's all going to end and what it all meant in the first place. The book in the right hand of God on his throne, the scroll is full. It's complete, God's plan. That's signified by its double-sided writing. You see that? It's written without and within, inside and outside. It's full. It's got to be completed in all of its precision and power because that's our God. Not one detail ever falls through the cracks with our sovereign holy God. The book we're told is sealed perfectly, the number seven signifying perfection, completion, seven seals. And if you keep reading Revelation, it becomes clear each seal represents a plague, a judgment of God upon the earth. And so I want you now to be getting the scene, the searching, sorrowful scene. Who is worthy? To open the scroll and break its seals. That is to ask, who is worthy to fulfill and execute the plans and purposes of Almighty God for all of time and eternity and history? Who is worthy to execute the plans and purposes of God to redeem and to judge? To make all things right and all things new? Who is worthy? 
And the answer, shocking. Verse 3, and no one. Are you listening? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began weeping loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll to look into it. Searching, sorrowful scene. Imagine the shock of the Apostle John as the answer comes or he tells us at least there was a great pause in all of heaven and earth. A great silence after the question, who is worthy? There was no immediate answer perhaps. A deafening silence. And John interprets it, no one. Is there no one? Not Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, not Moses, not David, not Ruth, not Hannah, not Peter, not Paul, not John. And presumably, the pause or the silence must indicate to John, not even Jesus. No wonder John weeps and wails and moans. Has he been duped? I mean, he's the apostle of love. We're preaching on Sundays through the Gospel of John, and we see him always magnifying Jesus as the sovereign creator and savior and judge. I mean, has he been duped? Are all the promises of God impotent? Are, are these all just hopeless falsehoods? I mean, is it just myth as all the critics have said? Is the Bible wrong and Darwin's right? We're all just organized, accidental, spontaneous pun scum? Are all the religions of the world right? Which just give you nothing but meaningless and hopelessness. Is that what it's come to? I don't think we understand the gravitas of the scene here. If verse 3 is the reality, then eat and drink for tomorrow we die. There's no hope. And there's no meaning. Weep no more. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. There's a word of hope coming, church. Stop weeping. I love how the scene so quickly shifts, doesn't it? From a searching, sorrowful scene to stop crying, man. Dry your eyes. Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered. He has overcome so that he can open the scroll in its seven seals. Hallelujah. There's hope. Amen. There's a worthy one. So much Old Testament symbolism and illusions. And we could spend hours plumbing the depths of how the Old Testament is being fulfilled to us in this chapter. Let me just give you some hints here. The lion of the tribe of Judah means that Genesis 49, the prophecy of Jacob, is fulfilled in this one who is called the lion of the tribe of Judah. That prophecy said that there would be a lion from the tribe of Judah and the scepter that is the rule and the reign would never depart from his hand. The root of David tells us Isaiah chapter 11 is fulfilled in this one. The Messiah, the King, the Lord, He is not just a mere human descendant of David. He is David's source. He is the fountainhead of David's life. Jesus Himself claimed this, did He not, when He challenged His enemies. Who is the Messiah? Is He just the son of David? And if so, why did David say of him the Lord said to my Lord sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool 
Oh, what a lion. The worthy lion. So John dries his eyes and turns, perhaps, expecting to see. Come on, folks, you, you alive? A lion. Some of you are overthinking it. I right, just, just use the words of the text, right? They're God's words. A lion. And in the midst of the throne, the ESV says between, I prefer the translation. In the midst, right in the middle of the throne and the living creatures and the elders, I saw a lamb standing, having been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Imagine, you turn expecting to see the lion of the tribe of Judah, and instead you see a lamb and two perfect tense verbs to describe this unique lamb. He is one of a kind lamb. He is extraordinary. Nothing ordinary about this lamb. He is the lamb who is the slain lamb and the standing lamb. He's having been slain, so he still bears his marks, but he's standing forever and ever alive. Casting crowns sings a song, the only scars in heaven won't belong to me and you. But we know such thing is broken. All the old will be made new. This is our lion who is our lamb. He is the lion lamb. John Piper says it this way, the lion gets the victory through the tactics of the lamb because Jesus is a lion-like lamb and a lamb-like lion. He has the right to bring the world to an end for the glory of his name and the good of his people. Hallelujah, end quote. The hallelujah was mine. The lion who is the lamb, he's a unique lamb. He has seven horns, symbolic of his omnipotence. Horns in the Old Testament, always, almost always symbolic of the powers of kings to rule and reign. He's completely powerful and sovereign. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient and omnipresent. He has seven eyes. He sees it all and he knows it all. And he's omnipresent. Because these eyes represent the complete Spirit of God, the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. You can't run from Him. You can't hide from Him. You can't escape His gaze. This is an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present Lion who is the Lamb. He is the suffering slain servant of Isaiah 53. And just as the Son of Man in Daniel chapter 7 comes and takes the scroll from God's right hand so it's fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus Christ because John says he came and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. How and why could he do such a thing? Because he's worthy. Because he's worth. He alone, are you hearing me? He only is worthy. He's worthy as the creator who was crucified and resurrected. Will you go back to Revelation chapter 1? Revelation chapter 1, verses 4. And onward, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so... Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come. 
the Almighty. Skip to verse 17 after this description of the risen glorified Christ. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and Hades. This is the worthy lion who is the lamb, who is worthy, the crucified, resurrected, conquering Christ. I tell you today, He's the crucified, conquering Christ of the church. He's the head, the judge, and the rewarder of His church. Will you continue in Revelation chapter 2, verse 1? To the angel of the church at Ephesus write, The words of Him who holds the seven stars in His right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands, I know your works. Verse 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Verse 8. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty. Verse 11. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Verse 12, and to the angel of the church in Pergamum write the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you dwell. Verse 17, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who conquers. I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Verse 18, and to the angel of the church at Tyra Tyra write the words of the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works. Verse 26, the one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron as when earthen pots are broken in pieces. Even as I myself have received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Are you getting the picture? Are you seeing a theme? Are you hearing the repetition? Let's go to chapter 3, verse 14. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. Verse 21, the one who conquers. I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. Are you hearing these promises? Are you blown away at such an offer of grace and mercy from the lion who is the lamb? Conquer with me. I will grant him to sit on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear. What the Spirit says to the churches. He alone is worthy. He alone is the head, the judge, and the rewarder of his church. No wonder the scene swiftly shifts again. We started with a searching, sorrowful scene. And then we had a slain but standing Savior. And now, what do you give to a slain Standing Savior. Supplication and singing. We have supplicating singing saints. And when he had taken, verse 8, Revelation 5, verse 8, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures, and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. You see, John tell us the identity, the full deity of Jesus, the Lion and the Lamb. They fall down before God in Revelation 1. They fall down before the God-man, the God who is the Son of Man, who is the Lion and the Lamb. They fall down, each having a harp. They're praising Him. In golden bowls full of incense, they pray to Him, which are the prayers of the saints. 
And they sang a new song. And oh, what a song they sing. What a song that the elders and the four living creatures and the saints sing together. Worthy are you, they sing to the Lamb. To take the scroll, to open its seals, because you were slain, and by your blood you have ransomed, you have purchased a people for God. You have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign upon the earth. I could not possibly give you better, more encouraging news if you are in Christ Jesus today. I tell you, He is worthy of your prayers, of your singing. They sang a new song. I'm inviting you to join it today by faith. Jesus, the crucified, conquering Creator, Christ and King, is worthy because by His blood poured out on the cross, He purchased a people for God. You see that? He purchased a people for, for God. The cross accomplished exactly what it was supposed to accomplish. Not one of God's people, foreknown and foreloved, fall through the cracks. The people were died for by the righteous one, the lion who is the lamb. He gathers a people from all tribes and languages and peoples and nations. A people were bought by his blood from all peoples. Hallelujah. A people from all peoples. And I tell you, because he lives, his people live. And because he has conquered, his people conquer. And because he is a king, his people are a kingdom. Because he is the eternal high priest, his people are priests. Because he reigns, his people reign. Now I know all those things I just said. So often in the church now, hard to see. So often we don't look much like kings and priests to our God. Sure don't seem like we're reigning. There's an already not yet here, I'm convinced. Things yet to come. But we're supposed to, by the grace of God in Christ that saved us and sanctifying us, be at least a little glimpse of this here on earth. But I know it's hard to see. I know his people may not look like much now. <coughs> look around us. None of us look like much now. I mean no insult. I include myself in that. I know the church so often doesn't seem like a nation or a kingdom of priests who reign. But I tell you that those imprisoned Christians in North Korean labor camps today are kings. I tell you those Christian daughters being forced into Muslim marriages all over the world are queens. I tell you beheaded martyrs will one day be the heads of the earth. Why? Why? Because the doorposts of their hearts were painted by the blood of the only worthy Lamb. Listen to me. Please listen to me. When God sends His death angel through the camp, only the blood of Jesus will suffice to save your soul. When God's death angel marches through, even the heir to the throne of Egypt dies and is judged. God is no respecter of persons. He only has regard for the lion. Who is the Lamb? He only has regard for the crucified, conquering Christ, the King. Worship Him today. Bow down to Him today. I want you to join the supplicating, singing saints. I'm asking you, I'm urging and imploring you on the authority of Revelation 5 to join your voice with the cosmic chorus. Never has a song or a chorus been so universal and cosmic and great. The saints and the seraphim are all shouting to the sitting Savior. You'd think that if this passage ended at verse 10, it would be enough for us. 
to worship the lion who is the lamb forever and ever, and indeed it would, but John's not done. The vision's not over. Verse 11, I looked then, and around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, I heard the sound of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice shouting worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing a sevenfold blessing to the lamb a perfect complete blessing to his majesty to his worthiness Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Now the angels are shouting it out. Well, you think that would be enough? It's not done yet. He's too worthy. It can't be done yet. No, no, no. Every creature. I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them, saying to Him who sits on the throne and unto the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Is your voice a part of this great cosmic chorus? This shouting to the sitting Savior. Don't miss the flow of Revelation 5. It began with God seated on His throne. Then we were told that a Savior came and was slain. He laid down. But He stood up from that grave. And now, by the end of Revelation 5, He too is seated with God. Other passages would say He is seated at the right hand of the Father. Ruling and reigning, receiving praise and honor and glory and worship as only God Almighty ever could or should. Why? Because He's worthy. He is God. He's God the Son. He's the Son of God. He's the Lion. He's the Root. He's the Lamb. He's the Creator. He's the Redeemer. He's the King. He's the crucified, conquering Christ. And I tell you, He has come. And I tell you, He is coming again. Read the rest of the book of Revelation. Go home and read it today. Read it this week. He's coming again. And you will answer to Him. There are all kinds of reasons people give for rejecting the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We went through many of them this morning in Sunday school. Just people try to give intellectual arguments or argue against the reliability of the New Testament, but I want you to listen to me very closely. And if you need me to sit with you for hours and hours and convince you of what I'm about to say, I am so willing to do it. I'd be happy. It would give me joy. I want you to listen to me. No one ever rejects the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ for good reasons. It's not intellectual. It's not evidence that's lacking because it's the most historically verifiable event in all of ancient history your problem is spiritual if you're here today and you're rejecting what I've said you're rejecting the truth of the risen reigning and returning lion who is the lamb I tell you your problem is sin sin blinds you Sin binds you and sin buries you. And so you need to call out to the resurrected Savior today that He would give you His resurrection life. You need to be raised from the grave of your sins. And there's only one who's worthy to do such a thing. Call upon the name of the Lion who is the Lamb. Bow to the Lamb this morning. Or you will be banished to hell by the lion. What will you do? What will your answer be?
to the question of all questions. Who is worthy? God help us bow to the Lamb that we might not be banished by the lion. The next time he comes, the book of Revelation is very, very clear. He will come to judge and make war. And all those who have rejected him will be cast into the lake of fire. I pray a sober, sober warning would come over every man, woman, boy, and girl here. God, have mercy on these dear people. Save their souls. Open their eyes. Help them by faith. Unite their voice with this cosmic chorus. To him who sits on the throne and unto the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Let's fall down and worship the only worthy Lamb. The only worthy Lamb. It's in his strong name we pray. Amen.